there's um, for the people who came on early, I, I did say something about this proclamation you have on the screen. Uh, we, are, we are entering into modern art with today and the really revolutionary modernists from Russia. Uh, from the screen, you would think we were going to talk about two people. I'm talking today essentially about Natalia Goncharova, and who from the time of her, she was in art school in Moscow until her death, was the partner of Mikhail Larionov. But although in many ways they, they worked in tandem, to be a woman artist doing the things she did was more revolutionary than in fact what he was. So I'm focusing primarily on her. For those who are deeply, deeply into modern art, seeing this screen might stir another, oh, really? Their birth year is the same year that Picasso was born. So that's the cohort that now we're working with. Nat Natalia and Mikhail both always thought of themselves as through and through ardently Russian artists. Although from the time of the um, World War I on, they spent the rest of their careers in Paris. But the really decisive work is early in their, in their lives. That's the, a kind of a prelude. Let's see if I can, yeah, I wanna go back just a bit as a setup for this to Ilya Repin and several things about him. One, before I forget, um, Doris Shapira found something that I'm going to recommend to everybody. She went to um, the Mets website and looked up Repin because I had said that there was, th that uh, there's a portrait by Repin of a man named Garshin, G-A-R-S-H-I-N, in the Met. And there's, um, she was able to pull up a, an, an article about the writer as artist model um, that Garshin in that tragic painting of Tsar um, Ivan the Terrible, killing his son, supposedly, accidentally, that uh, this Garshin was a model in that for the son and in several other paintings, because we'd had that discussion of, um, there was some questioning about how often um, was he using people from the life when he does these paintings that sometimes look just incredibly, almost photographically realistic. And this was that painting he did, Repin did in the late 1880s, um, it ostensibly celebrates the Tsar Alexander III's uh, coronation, although it, it was here as he's meeting everybody in the courtyard of his palace. So it was an occasion to show the Tsar reaching all sorts of people from all the farthest regions of his territory. <clears throat> And I have some other reason for bringing that in as a way of setting it up for the modern art we're looking at. You'd only seen that, and before that, icons. In both cases, paintings that are in the service of something else. Um, icons, of course, it is to, um, they're vehicles of devotion, of, of bringing the divine and the secular into contact with one another. And in Rappen, like the whole group of wanderers with which he was connected early in his career, their desire was to um, encourage uh, a change in social attitudes, a broadening of awareness of society beyond the aristocratic circles around the Tsar in St. Petersburg, um, and to use art to help to um, educate the wider public, reaching people far, far from the capital or from Moscow. 
That's why they were called the Wanderers because they had exhibitions in other places. <clears throat> so it had um, a, a predominantly social consciousness. Now here by the end of his career or late in his career, he is, he is just so illustrious, so famous. He is also working for the man, not just for the people in general. It's not that he and his group are not generating exactly the purpose of what they're doing. But art for social, didactic, religious, or decorative, I would say, are the, were the four main um, functions of painting. Not painting for painting's own sake. And that emerges at the very, well, in France in the second half of the 19th century, and pretty widespread as we move into the 20th, and actually with the beginning of the so-called modern era. Would you believe it? There was a, it was a term developed by Baudelaire in France. He was the first to even coin the phrase modernism, sort of signaling that something was so distinctly different in modern life. The fact that life was now <clears throat> urbanized, industrialized, um, education was for more widespread, um, societies were increasingly democratized. It was just a, a sense that things were qualitatively and quantitatively different than there had been before. So we'll see how that shows itself in art today in Russia, Natalia Goncharova. <clears throat> One more painting by Repin, and then we'll see her. It's a really handsome portrait of a very handsome woman who happened to be a teacher in the Moscow Art School. Um, Repin did this in the mid 1880s. <clears throat> and uh, there's no hint of her vocation here. I wouldn't say that, except that she has fairly strong looking hands. There's certainly nothing of the apparatus of being an artist here, but she, she presents herself as a woman of, of worth and of poise. So it's, it's a fine representation. And this is Natalia Goncharova. I will come back to the, this particular painting in a moment, <clears throat> but you know that this is a completely different world. What happened to the finesse, the sheer sophistication of the technique in that painting, in the poise, the polish of that woman and the painter, or the woman and a painter, as a painter, In this, you see a woman, but you also equally are drawn to the fact that this is a painting that's been painted with, oh, you can see adjacent strokes of this color and that color uh, figured with a really dark outline, which you seldom find. You find, might find a halo of light around someone who's backlit, but not a dark outline. This is drawing and using paint on a canvas to present something. It's a, a flat painting. Yeah. There's not even really much of a distance behind this. So there's something radically different between these two. And Natalia Goncharova was one of the most radical of the young artists in Moscow. She and her family, well, her family background was that she grew up um, I think the estate was south of Moscow, a kind of a country estate. Her family was possibly you'd say the genteel impoverished, but they had, um, she had illustrious forebears going back to Pushkin. Her mother's family side, her, her grandfather was a professor of theology. So it was, it was very educated, but um, away from the capital. And then when she was 11, her family moved to Moscow. We'll find that she's always very interested in peasant life. I oh, she's gonna somehow manage to play both urban and, and peasant off one another. 
But um, she was, from the time she was young, just a remarkable person. She knew early she wanted to go to art school and she enrolled in the Moscow Academy of Arts School of, of Painting, Sculpture, and, and um, I think it's Painting, Drawing, and Sculpture. And the remarkable feature was that she registered in sculpture. Women did not do sculpture. So she was in the sculpture department for a few years. And um, she increasingly was, um, I would say involved in, I wouldn't say it swept up in, in the revolutionary fervor in the, among young artists in Moscow. Now there was in 1905, the, the, a revolution within Russian politics at that time because um, Tsar Nicholas had been just such a wretched military leader that he impoverished the country with a failed war with Japan and people um, revolted until he agreed to have this, um, the Duma, um, a development of a, a consultative political parties um, power so that he wasn't the absolutist rule that he had been before. And um, so that was a great change, but it seems that, um, Natalia was, was never interested in politics. Her, her revolution comes within the realm of art and um, the way of life of the young people, because it's a time of challenging everything. So here you have a, a photograph of her as a young woman. So she switched over to painting in the Moscow school. And um, I guess it would be in her late teens. She, had, uh, she and Larionov met in a class. And from that, they were life companions from then on. They married ultimately, I think in the 50s, which in itself it was quite unusual that to, to have a long-standing but unsanctioned um, arrangement like that. So there she is. And here's Larionov. He was also a force, a large man, and a force just from the force of his personality. But uh, he and she will develop a brand new style in art, which we will get to. But he also has a very significant role to play because he um, managed to mobilize people to arrange a lot of small exhibitions, unsanctioned small venue exhibitions of the newest art so that people could see what was going on around Moscow. And he also uh, had works from the Parisian avant-garde brought to Moscow so that people could see what was going on. So. Here from the 1913 is an example of just how absolutely radical they will become. They, um, this is a film still from a futurist film called Cabaret 13. And it shows the two of them. Here he is, and evidently he has green colored teardrops on his face. And Goncharova has a kind of a lewd face drawn all over her torso. And there were um, various absurdist images throughout. And here they are, late in life in Paris, where they lived in pretty much penury toward the end of their lives. After, um, well, with the rise of the Soviet Union, they were never allowed to go back to Russia. They continued in the Paris to create theatrical and ballet designs, costumes and flats uh, for Diaghilev's Ballet Russe. And ballet, uh, Diaghilev is a significant figure in all of this too, but just so you see them there. Now we get them in the trajectory of their arts. And it actually brings together Larionov, Goncharova and Diaghilev at the very beginning. 
<clears throat> because Diaghilev had started out as a kind of a dilettante. He was not an artist, but he was interested in what was new. And he was um, a kind of a co, well, a collaborator on a new magazine and an art movement called The World of Art that was bringing together what was new in Europe and what was new in Russia. <clears throat> and uh, then he got involved in theater. So he's, and in literature, and just all, all the, the fine arts. And he was, had that same nature of an impresario, no matter what he was doing. And in 1906, he arranged for um, the, a group of Russian artists to be able to exhibit their works in the Autumn Salon in Paris in 1906. Now, that's the, one of the two main venues for new art in Paris annually. And Diaghilev asked three young artists, the others were all mainly established, and the two of the ones that were young that he invited were Larionov and, and Goncharova. And this is, I don't know that this is exactly the painting that Goncharova sent, but it's from that year, 1906. It, um, it would look very modern for the time, but also very much in line with Cezanne, Van Gogh, um, Gauguin, a very post-impressionist look. So the two of them, Larionov and Goncharov, went to Paris for the first time in 1906. Not only did they see their works, but then they, um, so a retrospective of all of Gauguin's work. That's the first time there'd been a retrospective. So they were seeing works like, you know, from the Met, the Hail Mary like this, with its exotic, uh, vivid coloring and intentionally sort of um, primitive stylizing of an alien culture, uh, a new world unfamiliar to people in Paris. So they saw that, being brought up to date with what's new. And then, of course, back home, they would join the other people who on Saturday afternoons could go visit Shukin's uh, palace, uh, or large house in Moscow, which he opened up to the public so that people could see the art that he went annually to Paris to buy or sometimes bought without with sight unseen. Um, in this room, it's primarily Picasso's. He owned more Matisse's than he had Picasso's, but there are early Cubist paintings in here, as well as blue and rose periods. And over in here, there's one by the Dunier Rousseau. So there's a kind of neo primitive work. What I didn't say when I showed you this last time is that the Russians coming in, the Muscovites coming in and seeing this, saw altogether more of the avant-garde, absolutely new Parisian art than anybody in Paris could. Um, most of these works were not on display at the dealer's back rooms, um, just not visible then. People only got to these sort of by word of mouth, learning about the artists. So in a sense, Moscow was ahead. or here, all those Matisse's. So Larionov and Goncharova didn't even have to go to Paris before they were seeing, or when they saw very contemporary work. So we come back to her portrait. Um, this is from 1907. I think I'm right, yeah. And it's in the Tretyakov gallery. There is something even in the way she presents herself here. Look how directly she looks out at us. You know, how adroitly she hides the fact that one arm is, is busy making the painting by having this orange lilies, very much uh, sort of like a Van Gogh color scheme there, um, 
concealing where that arm would be. But the very frank and level way she's looking out at you is not something that would really be of the, um, say, um, polite society social norm. It's much more self-possessed than that. And so she shows herself and she does not make herself look any more attractive than she was. She shows herself in peasant costume, although she was not a peasant. She makes willful distortions. Look at this great hand. Now, a woman in polite society would not be advertising with fans that she had a hand of a worker. And the style and the color is some Cezanne, some Van Gogh, some Gauguin. It's evident uh, the, the truism is that art from Moscow tends to be very colorful and the art from people go to the academy in St. Petersburg tends to be more linear, but this is certainly color, intense color. This is um, a peasant woman from Tula and she even more exaggerates the outlines here. And the hands, they are a lot like a lot of Cezanne paintings have hands and the fingers placed just like that. Now the costume is Russian folk costume. So there's a combination of the most avant-garde art from Paris with the native Russian tradition. And that's what Goncharova will do. Uh, some of you uh, I know were in the uh, series of classes I gave on modern women artists. And uh, we talked about one Russian woman there, Sonia Delaunay, but Sonia's career was mainly in Paris. She sort of didn't exactly blend in, but she worked more within the Parisian scene. Whereas Natalia is resolutely, flamboyantly Russian throughout. That she wants to create something new for Russia. But you have this really very fine portrait. Uh, again, someone staring straight ahead. You can see frozen in place here. But these patches of color, that's a little a la Cezanne again. So she's uh, mixing and matching from all these different sources that she's uh, bringing in from the West. So just for the sake of it, this eight, late 1880s, this is also from the Met, um, Van Gogh. You see those very heavy black outlines. And uh, brush strokes are not too different from what she's using. And she was aware of Picasso in his mm, nascent, it's called proto-cubist phase. In fact, this painting, which is called a dryad from 1908 is in Russia. So I believe, I don't know if this was in uh, Shukin's collection, or there was another major collector, a man named Morosov. So she, she probably saw this. Well, she would have seen this in Russia. So there's an even more radical style she can learn from, pit herself against. And now we're going to start primarily with her work. She was a proud Digis producer of paintings. Um, the, she was the first modern woman artist. I don't know if maybe it was the first modern artist in Russia to have um, a one person show of all her work. In um, 1913, she had one. And she had something like 800 paintings in that show. So not only was she just so just spilling out with all of these paintings, but there is no stylist consistency. She is almost like a magpie um, that there's, it's not that she will take an idea and then work it through, you know, in a sort of serial sense before going on to something else. 
in the same year, she has works of look like this, look like this, look like that. Ultimately, later on in life, she has a style, the terms coined by Larionov. Her style was called everythingism because she, it draws on everything. Well, this one was a particularly significant painting in a way. Um, it's just the nude against a blue background in this 1909-1910. Here's her motto. She said, I set myself no limits in terms of artistic achievements. Well, this was a painting that appalled everybody. The academic establishment, shocked. Avant-garde establishment, as it was forming, shocked. Because, first for the academic establishment, this is a woman who's painted a nude. That was still not part of the accepted studio learning or studio practice for women to have access to nudes. And not only is it this is a study of a nude, this is a woman shown so frankly, so frontally, and her complete torso, including all her sexuality. I know some French mid 19th century paintings and plenty of French postcards that show like that, but this was not done. And then it's a very masculine looking figure, isn't it? It's extraordinary strength. It's not just a, the soft curves of a woman. The modeling shows her awareness of something like this. But that is so removed from being a, uh, that, that can be a, something produced straight out of Picasso's head, not a, having a living model, but this. So there was a lawsuit instituted against her um, and on the terms of um, corrupting, um, it's a, a corrupting picture of nudes being available for public viewing. And uh, so she had to appear in court. Uh, she, she, her defense was for, um, she had artistic creativity, the freedom to do whatever she wanted. But what finally got her off was that they decided it wasn't in a public exhibition space. So on that kind of technicality, they, the Tsarist authorities had to back off. Now that shows one sort of the aspect of this faceted surfaces. Think of Demoiselle d'Avignon, for example, could have brought that in again. You could see that, which she would not have known as a kind of a inspiration. And this is also like this sort of pre, sort of proto-cubist phase in Picasso's work. This painting of hers called uh, Peasants Picking Apples. Come back to that in a minute. We'll look at that some more. Because I want to here, make a, a digression. It's probably not addressed to any of you who, who are um, listening to this now, but it's a, the great world out there somewhere. Here, here you have a, a Picasso from 1910 that's in the Museum of Modern Art. A uh, woman playing a mandolin in his it, um, analytical cubist phase. And so that's around 1910. And here's a painting he did from, well, let me see. I want to make sure I get the year right. Um, oh, it's in the 1880s anyway. Sometimes the, the easy assumption is that it's more difficult to create a painting that looks like life, like this, which for Picasso was, alas, just all too easy. He did this when he was 16 also. That makes this 1897 when this was done.
And instead, this is far more difficult because this is exploration, innovation, finding a new way. Actually, he's trying to respond to the scientific understanding of <clears throat> how forms are constantly changing, how, how on a flat surface can you show them from various angles, um, that this is exploration. So sometimes things that look either bewildering or primitive are not at all a revelation of anything about the artist. They are sometimes the most difficult. Although for Concharovo, I don't know whatever was difficult. But that was setting you up for this. This is just called hate cutting. And it's from the year of her self-portrait. Where are those uh, parallel strokes of different colors? Gone. Where's the sort of sense of proper proportion? Gone. In fact, what do you make of this? Here they're gathering the sheaves. Here he is with the sigh. Here it must be they're taking the wagon off someplace. So it's the kind of peasant scene she likes. What's happened to these faces? Uh, I think most people or many people would say, oh, that's like a kid's drawing. Of course it is, because that's one of the sources she's looking at. <clears throat> she not only is absorbing, working with all that she's seeing that's coming out new from Paris, but she's also looking at, for new inspiration in Russian art, but not the Russian art, oh, heaven forbid, from the wanderers or from the, by now, very establishment art. <clears throat> She's going back to folk art, peasant embroideries, icons. This is, the, this is just around the time when icons are now um, becoming recognized as art. Um, and a kind of folk art that I will show you in a moment. So <clears throat> it doesn't have any, doesn't present any of the traditional issues. Like, how do you show recession into depth? Well, no, no interest in that. How do you decide what colors things go? Well, you make the colors you want. Is there modeling? Is there verisimilitude? No. So what are the principles on which you decide to do something? You see, that's where the challenge was. So here you can see a kind of like a, a harmony in the shapes and the angles, but um, she's having then to make all of this basically on her own instinctive aesthetic decisions rather than by verifi verification through something she sees in the outer world. Uh, choice of colors, sizes, and placement of everything. So this is the sort of thing she was looking at. These are, there's a special term for their, this kind of Russian folk art. They were um, little woodblock prints that would be printed and then uh, people would, um, specialists, but I mean, you know, not what we think of as a specialist, but people who just painted uh, would then paint them in. So each one might have a different color. And I think this is a, like a folk tale in this one with a kind of the very sort of vivid color that she is always drawn to. But you see there too, you don't like, is he standing in anything? No, he's standing on a line. Like, oh, it's familiar to us now from cartoons. And this figure, mm, is he farther back? What kind of proportions does he have? What happens to his body back? It doesn't matter. What happens to the table? Oh, well, you see that in icons too. Or this one. You know, like the fruits on those trees. Or this marvelous cat. Let's go back to this one for a moment. I was posing this question for myself. myself. When we look at this, it's sort of like folk art. Flat, spaceless art seems to be what most people do until they have been 
had some art training. So it must be something more instinctive to us to be that way. I don't know. And of course, icons. And this is a kind of a folk icon of St. George, where you see, when you look around here, say, these people not standing in anything, on anything, feet sort of dangling in space, awkward proportions. And this is hers. This is more scandal. This is Archangel Michael, 1910. Um, what's the scandal here? Well, she's transgressing in the fact that religious art icons were made only by monks, by men. It's not something women could do any more than a woman could paint a female nude. She does not recognize that there are boundaries that, can, that social conventions limit what she can do. And this is very much like an, an icon that the image is based on with this great, wonderful color. Or... Now you've seen enough Madonna and child icons so that you know the tradition from which something like this would come. And that's 1911. And that's the same year as that. So as easily as I can toggle between images, She's toggling between modes of representation. And this, before evangelists, and this is 1911. Disturbed the religious establishment very much, again, because it's a woman who's doing it. And then I couldn't find a close up of any of these for you to be able to see. These are four individual panels. Um, the painting techniques, the way she, oh, let's see, let's take this area over here. You could lighten up ah, straight out of Cezanne. She, at one point, uh, well, let me give you couple of quotes from her. She said, I shake the dust from my feet and leave the West, considering its significance trivial and vulgarizing. My path is towards the source of all art, the East. The West has taught me one thing. Everything it has is from the East. <laughs> but what she, and another point said that those artists like Gauguin, Van Gogh, taught her to look again more sympathetically with fresh eyes at her own native Russian folk tradition. So it was through the Western avant-garde she got to her own native heritage, and um, which I find is a very interesting uh, perceptive comment for probably the way a lot of learning goes on. You see someone else learn something and you can learn from them. So this is all 1910, 1911, the same year as the four evangelists, she does this one. Uh, it's called Rabbi with a Cat. You might wonder, what's this hand up here? Well, in icons, in Western religious painting of other kinds too, that often represents God. That's the hand of God. And look at this nice arc over this. It's hard to say if this is 
if you imagine this in a doorway, I don't think you can you can't can't really place it in anything in the, the physical world. Then what's going on back here? Two men hiking along with enormous packs on their back. The pogromas have started. So these certainly are to suggest Jewish refugees. And the way he looks toward his cat and the cat looks out at you and the way it doesn't quite rest in his arms, that's the how many icons of the virgin and child. So out of Eastern Orthodoxy, you have this composition, that curve, and this applied to a Jewish subject. Not any Jewish subject, but that one refers to actually the, the persecution that the Jews are facing at the time. Oh, that's, that was deeply contentious. And um, she always seemed to have a great sympathy for outsiders, whether it's Jews or peasants or workers. From around the same time she does this one. Two men seated or Shabbat. And then, mm, that was 1911. Here's what she did in 1913. <clears throat> Let's just call linen. She switched back. I mean, in this particular painting, in the, in the order in which I'm showing it to because she's always, as I said, playing, playing with all of these. Uh, this is very strongly Cubist inspired with intersecting forms and objects seen from separate sides. Never as rigorously cubist as, as what Picasso in his analytical or synthetic cubist phase either. But like cubist, there's a little writing and then fragmented forms. Um, there's, the words here are fragments of the word for, for a laundry or a laundromat. And I read one uh, comment on this painting, uh, sort of like someone suggesting and thinking about it. It's, it's fairly um, strange. On the left side, you have items of men's clothing, collars, cuffs, starch shirts. And over here you have lace, the women's. Uh, so there's this thought, well, maybe this is some commentary on her relationship with Larianov and wh why there would be the, the sexual division in the um, costume like this. Peculiar. So we have to have a little bit of a change because there's something else that in, uh, comes on the scene now. You've got cubism, you've got post-impressionism, you have neo-primitivism, and then emanating out of Italy comes futurism. And I'll give you just a little of Italian futurism till we see what she does with it. Uh, futurism was a movement founded by a small group spearheaded by a man named Miranetti in 1909. And the futurists <clears throat> sought to just overthrow all the hidebound traditional backward lookingness of Italy, and they they uh, were peons of praise of to machines and speed and new technology. And from this futurist manifesto, one of the phrases is, uh, uh, "Speeding motor car is more beautiful than the winged victory of Samothrace." You know, it's down and it's down with feminism. It's 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 down with anything in the past. You know, we're going to crash through and make a new world. And they were as flamboyant as possible even by making this the front page of the Figaro newspaper. 
So I'll give you a couple of examples of Italian futurist painting. This manifesto was translated in Russia just a couple of months after, after um, it was published in Paris. So here's this, this one in, in the modern, uh, a painting of the city also rises. Now, the futurists didn't really have so much a technique, the Italians, but they were about how you can show speed and dynam dynamism and change in whatever they do. So here you can see horses. These are men working on the streets. There's a um, factory going up here. There are men on strike. But it's the idea of just everything, just a swirl, a rush of motion. And that's why they have all these trucks, you know, just doing it as rapidly as possible. Same artist who did that, did trying to capture the idea of a person moving in space. This also is from the modern, it's a unique form of continuity in space. So the retinal after image is there as well as with the figure moving. Or at the beginning of uh, when, when uh, Italy joined um, in fighting in World War I, one of the man, uh, manifestos that they said was, war is good for art, it's a new hygiene. And uh, this is a painting of uh, men fighting. That's also in the modern. So futurism enters into Russia. Marinetti even made a trip there. He, he didn't like it and they didn't like him because he was so strongly a misogynist and women were very important in these, these revolutionary moments. <clears throat> but so in Russia, they form a kind of a, a new movement and this is distinctly Russian. It's not like Italian futurism and it's not like French cubism. It's called cubo futurism. It has the splintered forms like cubism, and then it suggests things of the speed and progress and mechanization as futurism does. And like the futurists elsewhere, it is uh, the people are drawn to be very flamboyant. They want to overthrow, jolt everybody out of the staid conventions of the past. So that's when she and a group of friends painted their faces and would parade around Moscow streets intentionally causing, you know, a spectacle. Here's a friend of theirs. Putting odd things in boutonnieres, bizarre clothing, Look what he has on his face. This or his earring. He was actually by uh, a wrestler, <laughs> by his background. So there, there's just a sense of a, flaunting, unsettling, just creating a new world. And many young Russians get involved in Cubo futurism. I'll just show you several of her works. This one, The Cyclist from 1913. So this is a cyclist on a cobblestone street. Bikes like this were very new. I mean, that, um, really very new, very fast. Cause you know, they had those big front wheel, two little, those little three wheelers were very staid driving on, on a bike before that. So it's a new kind of messenger going so fast and people seeing him, the words on the sign, they can't blur between the figure and the sign. Um, this looks just like one of the cobblestones. You can't grasp exactly what the forms are. Uh, he's a workman though, and then it plays off against someone with a top hat here. There's a kind of like a social commentary in it. But you mix words, you mix image. Poets were writing, uh, creating paintings, and almost all the painters were also doing poetry, and many of them were involved in music. So it was a tremendous, exciting uproar in the arts. This one's quite difficult to figure out what's going on here. It's just airplane and train. 
from this uh, 1913. So there's that futurist concern with the speed. Uh, planes have been around now for a decade, but they gave you this new vantage point, seeing the world from the sky and trains were faster than ever before connecting people. So in fact, news and work traveled very fast between Paris and Moscow. But is this, and then there's a person here. One theory, one possible interpretation has been, these two forms of, you're standing still, and these two forms of transportation go in succession across where you can see in your vantage point, or is this a crash? Is this a collision? That sounds awfully a terrible pun, pedestrian as an as a explanation. <clears throat> but as a thought, things, things are just too fluid to be captured in in any old fashioned way. Now this one, it's a station. You're inside a train car. Now, of course, this, this would be outside the train car. And here's someone looking out a window in the train car. You're rushing past some sign that you can only see a little bit right over here. You're out in the world there. You're in a train tunnel here. And it's all painted with this really dashing, fast way that just enhances the sense of the uh, discordant, overlapping, confusing, frantic pace of life. And then Natalia and Larionov together create a new kind of art, which is a distinctly Russian creation, and it's just theirs. It's called Rayism, that's what they called it, or Rayonism, R-A-Y-O-N-I-S-M, in, um, in, the, in the French. But here they are holding their Rayist paintings in their apartment in Paris. They continue to paint in a rayist style. And I'll give you just a, this is actually a close up of a painting. If, if I were able to show you the rest at the bottom, the green continues down. This is, it's a, a scene of a forest. <clears throat> you can never see green. You don't see ground. You don't see anything green. It largely is just these overlapping, streaking lines with a lot of light. So let's see if I can give you a little what they... I'll read to you something that, that Lariano wrote a manifesto for this. And <clears throat> I can't make anything out of it, but you, you might be able to read more. We do not sense an object uh, with color as it's depicted uh, conventionally in pictures in fact, we do not see an object as such. We see a, a sum of rays proceeding from a source of light, and these are reflected from the object, and they enter our field of vision. So this is very scientific. In the same way cubism, cubism was exploring what science, the development of, of X-rays, the interest in the fourth dimension, all that was bringing forth, because here, it's a truth. Without light, you can't see anything. You know, you go in a dark room, you're gonna trip over something because you can't see the object is there. And you only see what color it is by the rays of light that are reflected off of it. So it is light that gives us a visible world. So that's what their paintings do, is that they want to show you that light striking objects and coming back at your eye.
So these are representations of light rays and color rays emanating from objects, reflecting off objects. And that's the same, actually, that's the same philosophy under, under icons, but um, they're not thinking about that particularly. And this is as close, this is tiptoeing up at the very edge of abstract art. The saying that they're trying to show the real world as it really is, but the painting they produce is abstract. These are cats fighting. This is in the Guggenheim. It's variously interpreted this. Maybe this is a black cat and this is another black cat and maybe there's a tabby that they're fighting with. But that's straining to find an object, isn't it? This is more something we would look at and look at for what the alternate title of this is. Rhea's perception in rose, blues, and yellow. And there's a close up. And of course, as light rates hit something, the color will shift also. They're really very interesting when you get up close. I have to go way past. There's a whole lot of interesting work, but in the remaining three minutes, I do want to get to the what else their uh, careers were. <clears throat> Diaghilev, who was had this instrumental role in starting their careers, is pretty instrumental in their careers for the later part of their lives too. And there's a quote from Diaghilev about Natalia that I want to do want to say: This woman drags the whole of Moscow and the whole of St. Petersburg behind her. They don't just imitate her work, they imitate even her personality. And she was the dominant woman in early modern Russian art. But as I say, um, around the time, well, Diaghilev was banned from having a career in Russia because he fell afoul of one a minor functionary in the Imperial Tsarist Theater. So he took his ballet russe west, so shown in Paris and the US. And he invited Larionov back here and Natalia to come to work with him. So that's how ultimately they settle in Paris. And from then on their career, they continue making those rarest paintings, but they're best known in the public for their sets and costume designs. And I'll give you just here at the very end, a couple of her costume designs. And here, some costumes produced from her designs from, for Rimsky Korsakoff's The Golden Cockerel. So she's responsible for bringing, well, both of them, I would say, for bringing with Diaghilev, bringing Russian art to the West, not just taking Western art into Russia. I'll give you one more custom. There. She did make some fabric designs and she did some teaching of art. Oh, here's another custom she did for, uh, um, ballet that wasn't put on, but showing an angel. And then here, a fabric design from the 20s. That was for a Russian, uh, a Moscow fashion house. So that is to the moment and to my interest in hearing whatever questions you have, any comments you want to make. I will stop sharing unless there's anything 
someone wants to look at again. Maggie, there were some pictures that uh, reminded me of Chagall and also some of that futurist book like Thomas Hart Benton. Yep, it does. Um, Chagall, this, I just picked these up because there's, there's this whole hotbed. There's going to be some Chagall in here. There's, there's going to be Malevich in here. There's Kandinsky. They're all working together. They know one another. They're, they're, yeah. So I just picked her out for today. You're right on it. This one reminded me of the Escher picture. Yeah, yes, yeah, it does, doesn't it? It's going in opposite direction. Yeah, well, that's with fabric, you need something that has a repeat like that, a wallpaper, too. Yeah. All right, we'll see you next week with. Purely abstract. Now we tiptoed up to the border. Did did she sign her pictures? Wow. Does anybody did anybody look? I have to go pretty far back. Get somewhere there. Well, I love no. I really couldn't see a signature. Yeah. I just, you just passed. Oh, well, I see. I see. We just passed the one. Corner there. Yeah, we passed one. There's one. Be done. Yeah. Yes, we don't see. Can you yeah. imagine having an exhibition of 800 works? Oh my God. And they're all like eclectic, work, right? They're very different. All of them oh, are yeah. very different. Absolutely. Very, very different. Thank you, Maggie. Sure. <laughs> all right. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. It was great. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, no question. I love hearing that, but I really do love questions. <laughs> Thank you. Were these <laughs> primarily oils or watercolors? Yeah, no, they're all oils. oils. Except for those, you know, the costume design she did. Look at that. Can't you just imagine jolting along on this? <laughs> I just think how that uncomfortable that was. Absolutely. <laughs> the cobblestone streets were terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Exaggerated. <laughs> but her color is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, she loves color. Loves color. But that's a very Russian thing, color. Yep. Yeah. The Russians like color. That's right. Okay. Farewell.